now that we've figured out how to analyze our potassium current, our voltage-dependent potassium current, and we've figured out what our leak and our capacitive current look like, we can try to tackle the understanding of the sodium current, which is arguably the most complex one. So what what do we start with? Well, we've because um, at the time they did this, Hodgkin and Huxley only had choline, mm -hmm. right? They Which could cancels out our sodium. Could cancel out the sodium, so they could do uh, two parallel experiments. They could do experiments on the whole squid giant axon without canceling anything out. Mm -hmm. Then they could do experiments where they canceled out the sodium using the choline. So what could they do with that data to get just the sodium current? You could subtract that. Exactly, because now I C I L I K would be in both. The only thing that would be missing was I sodium, and so you could focus on that. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. Okay. And so we're now going to assume that we are looking at voltage clamp records where we subtracted out the capacitor, the leak, and the potassium, because it's already going to be pretty complicated to figure it out even when all that's gone. Okay, so we're doing our voltage clamp data looking at controlling our voltage in millivolts and looking at currents and what do we see? We start where? Uh, let's start at the resting potential. Sounds good. So our negative 60, mm -hmm. slightly tilty, and zero. Mm -hmm. So and then what do we do? Where do we want to step this to? Let's start by stepping it to something around the peak of the action potential, say to plus 30. I mean, you want to sure. give yourself some room because we may step beyond that. Let's say that's plus 30. Yeah, that's good. Good. And let's step to there. So we want to do it rest, mm -hmm. do a nice instantaneous step, a nice instantaneous step back. Okay. Um, and now, after subtracting everything else out, what Hodgkin Huxley observed, okay, so at, at rest, everything is going to be zero. Mm -hmm. And then they saw what kind of a current. Well, if you step it up and you're only looking at the flow of sodium, That's right. where it's high outside. That's right. Um, and you suddenly opened all these gates that let sodium go through them. Because mm -hmm, these are voltage activated. That's right. So until gates. then they were not significantly activated. Now they're very activated. Which way is the sodium going to go? It's going to go in. Exactly. So that's an inward current, which is an upward. I'm sorry, a downward. downward. That's right, downward. But now, the thing that, that's right, inward, outward. But now what was very strange is we saw the potassium, once you had the outward current developed, it stayed. Here the inward current developed and then it collapsed, even before you turned off the pulse. Nice sort of collapsing yes, that's before you turn off the pulse. That's what I like that. Good. Okay, so that's your sodium current. And so we have two things that are different. First of all, we see that it's an inward current, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. And we see that it collapses, which is not what we saw with the potassium. But now let's see what happens. Let's step to plus 60. So we start. Okay, so remind ourselves, where is the Nernst potential, or equilibrium potential, for the squid giant axon for sodium? What value it's is It's at 55. All right, so maybe let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine we'd stepped it to plus 55. Suddenly all those channels open. What would the current look like at plus 55? Well, let's go to our, our equation. Our handy-dandy equation. Our I sodium equals... G sodium times the driving force, Vm minus E sodium. Good. So when Vm is equal to E sodium, what is the driving force equal to? Zero. What does that do to the current? So the current should be zero. Okay, so, so let's draw that current. It would just stay like boring, that. Boring, boring, boring. Hold on. But we started at negative 60 right. without any current. Right. So what, what happened that was different? The gates were closed. The gates were closed. So, so the key thing here was that we stepped it positive, and so now G sodium is actually 
high. At rest, it was very, very low. Mm -hmm. Now it's high, but the driving force having gone to zero prevents us from seeing any current. Whereas when we were at negative 60, our gates were closed. Was closed, that was zero, but that, that was that high. Was okay, so and either way. But in both cases, you're only gonna end up with no sodium current. Okay, now if we step beyond, so to 60. To I'm 60. Green. You're green. Yep. Then what happens? Well, we've put so many positive charges inside. Mm -hmm. These are all really close to the membrane. Mm -hmm. but, right. Um, and now this, you've opened up a set of gates whose equilibrium potential is plus 55. And you've stepped the membrane to very depolarized plus 60. So our sodium is going to want to go out because exactly. there's so many positive charges That's inside. That's right. It's going to try to, so it's going to try to restore balance by going in the opposite direction. You're going to get an outward current, which then collapses as the conductance collapses. Mm -hmm. All right. So very helpful to see this. So two differences then from potassium. One is that the currents collapse, and the second is that they reverse sign as you go past the equilibrium potential. Why didn't we see that with the potassium? Um, because, well, let's see, potassium's inert potential, I'm just going to draw another one while I talk, mm -hmm. potassium's inert potential is pretty low, right? Mm -hmm. That's like negative like 80. Negative 80. Yeah. So it would, so even if we step negative, so past negative 80, because that's our right. reverse potential. Well, were those gates open? No, because potassium is positively... It, it, it needs depolarization yeah. to open those gates. So you, they, and then, if you start, uh, once you start um, stepping to very positive values, the gates open, and where are you relative to the? You're even farther from the that's right. reversal so potential. That means that it's going to just move in one direction, which is out. Mm -hmm. So that's why this is a much more complicated picture. Now, the next thing is we want to solve for the conductance with time. We and the way we did this with potassium was with our ends. Here. Well, before we go to that, let's. what's the equation that gives us G sodium? We have it up there. Just solve for G sodium. G sodium go is... Back to right. Consistency. That's right. G sodium is... We divide by, so we have I, I sodium, sodium divided by Vm minus E sodium. Excellent. Okay, so now we have our equations. We know Vm, we know E sodium, we know I sodium. So we can figure out what G sodium is over time. And let's draw those pictures of what the conductances look like. You might maybe want to put them down here underneath those. Once we take out the driving force, and now just look at the conductances, what do those plots look like? Um, well, I have our G sodium. Right. And so they, as you as you increase voltage. Right. They will. That's right. Like that first one was blue. The second one was. Should I color code these? Yeah, might as well. Might as well. Less confusing. First one was. First one was blue. Right. And then that one's pretty little. That's right. Good. The next one is. is that one's bigger. bigger. Okay, we take that out, and then we can do the green. That one's biggest. Biggest. Excellent. All right, now the interesting thing is this. It does not go up like a capacitor. There's, there's a delay. A delay. And there's also the fall is very rapid. It looks almost like a capacitor fall. Okay? So we, Kanchi and Huxley decided, okay, we'll have to deal with two possible variables here. One for activation and one for inactivation. And we'll again assume that they are completely independent. And we'll use M to represent activation, and we'll use H to represent inactivation. And since we don't see an immediate rise, we'll say, well, let's use the probability of, of a gate opening is M, going from 0 to 1. Mm -hmm. But we need more than 1 to be open. And the one that they came up with, so they said 3, and they're independent. So then the probability is M times M times M. And this was matched to the data that they matched got. To the data That's they how got. they got That's those right. 3. Now, we don't know yet how to match uh, inactivation. We'll talk about that next. But what they did assume was the following, that we multiply the 3Ms by H. 
and that h has the following thing. At the resting potential, h is actually equal to 1, unlike m, which is equal to 0. It's approximately equal to 1 at rest, whereas m is approximately equal to 0 at rest. So the overall equation for that is m times m times m times, a, m, uh, times h, which is m cubed h. And at rest, because the m is close to 0, the overall is close to 0. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first step, the m is going to rise to 1. Mm -hmm. And the h is already at 1. And so now m cubed h is going to be close to so this is like at the start of an action potential. Start of the action potential, which means that, that that allows it to rise, and then at the whole thing is high. But then as time goes on, and we'll talk about how they figured out that time, H now starts to close, reducing its probability to zero, even though M is perfectly high being at one. So near the end, right, that's, and that still stays at one. Well, M cubed H, you have three ones, 1 times 1 times 1 times 0 is? Still 0. All right. So you start with a low voltage dependent set in conductance at the peak. Near, as you rise to the action potential, it becomes high, and then it falls. Mm -hmm. OK. So now the next question was, how did they figure out the, the fall time for the H gate? Well, if I remember correctly, what they did is they delivered sort of two Pulses in quick succession. That's right. And then the, what you could do is you could look at what happened to the conductance. So if you put two pulses in, one after the other, and you now we're just going to be showing not the currents but the conductances down below, the first pulse gives you a nice, healthy, beautiful response, which of course collapses. But the second one gives you a very wimpy, short response because mm -hmm. the inactivation hasn't worn off. Now, if you let H go on for longer, you wait, I'm sorry, you let the second pulse happen much more slowly. Now, when you get to the second pulse, it does see, better. It does better. It comes up more. Mm, and then, not all the way, though. But not all the way. And then if you wait still longer. You can make our graphs longer. Right. <laughs> you wait still longer. Then this time it should be okay because. That's right. H has had time to go back to 1. Exactly. And so that gives you a time course for the recovery from inactivation, which is what they fit to determine the um, time course of the H. And again, we haven't written down the equations for how M and H change with time, but that's how they figured it out and fit it. Mm -hmm. And M cubed H is a probability ranging from 0 to 1. Exactly. So it works, again, just like our, our potassium equation. That's right. right. So now we can write down the sodium equation for the current. I sodium is equal to a maximum sodium conductance. So G and A in the bar means max. That's right. Times M cubed H times the driving force, which in this case is Vm minus V e sodium. And that was the last piece of the equivalent circuit, electrical equivalent circuit that we needed to figure out. Mm -hmm. So now we understand how they analyzed that. Cool. Very cool.